Another month has come, and that means a fresh, delicious patch of Farm Fresh Playdate titles has arrived. And I'm here as always to help you parse out which are worth your hard-earned bucks and which you may want to give a skip. Let's get right into it. I want to start with Slitherlink PD, an unlikely marriage of Snake and Minesweeper I never knew I wanted, and one of the most mechanically creative puzzle games I've seen on the Playdate yet. Its concept, though threatening to confuse with a hands-off and overly long slideshow of a tutorial, is actually quite simple. Your goal is to build a shape using a series of contiguous lines that ultimately connect in the end without overlapping. You're given a grid full of numbers, where each number represents how many of the four sides the shape uses. You'll navigate with the D-pad and hold A while doing so to draw a line, or hold B instead to draw an X to tell yourself that section can't be used. And although even the very first level is labeled in game as very easy, I don't think I found any levels to be instantly solvable. There's certainly a learning curve here as you figure out patterns that certain combos of numbers form. Thankfully, there is an in-game tips menu that can help you get better, but either way it will take some practice and careful thought to get good. If there's any downside to Slitherlink PD, it's that its presentation is pragmatic almost to a fault, with no music, just a few sound effects, and little in the way of visual elements beyond what's strictly necessary for game play. But that's fine, because it doesn't need any of that. This is a fun and deliciously clever puzzle game that offers 90 puzzles with lots of challenge for 5 bucks and is worth every penny. Next up is Crankshaft, a game whose name almost certainly wasn't meant to sound as potentially sexual as it does. Crankshaft is a platformer of sorts where you use the Playdate's crank to shift obstacles out of the way of a ball flying across the screen. While hitting obstacles is fine to do, it breaks your combo, and some pieces of certain obstacles that are darkly shaded can destroy your ball and force a restart. While I think Crankshaft has a fun concept and great use of the Playdate's crank, unfortunately, I didn't find its design to feel especially compelling or fair. The ball travels way too quickly, to the point that the frame rate heavily chugs and it's seemingly impossible to see the obstacles coming with proper time to react to them. As a result, the only ways I found to make reasonable progress were to take the obstacles one or two at a time and specifically not aim for high combos, or go the trial and error route, allowing myself to die repeatedly until I could figure out the maneuvers to get some decent combos together. It's also pretty bare bones, as I couldn't even figure out how to reach the main menu. For better or worse, clicking on the game from the Playdate home menu will take you right into the latest level, with nothing in the way of options to start from the beginning or give levels another go. Crankshaft certainly isn't a bad time, but it feels like a concept whose execution could have spent a bit more time in the oven. Next is You Cannot Go Back, a game I thought I hated at first. And I'm still not completely sure I like it, but once I stopped being hopelessly confused, an interesting game started peeking its way out. You Cannot Go Back spends absolutely zero time explaining what it's all about before throwing you into the deep end, so it's worth taking a look at its itch.io page before you start playing. This is ostensibly a roguelike where you make your way through a dungeon full of traps, puzzles, mazes, memorization puzzles, brief platforming sequences, and more. The room layout is randomized and often seemingly unrelated elements in prior rooms, like a number you see or or a word written on a wall will become crucial to making it out alive. The chaotic nature of the game once you actually figure out what's going on is somewhat of an asset to it, having an almost WarioWare-like feel to each of the dungeon's rooms where you must quickly figure out what needs to be done and make it happen. This is all fine, but frankly some of the rooms I found absolutely baffling, and one false move will lead you to imminent death. It's a bit discouraging to get through 10 rooms and find the 11th to be totally incomprehensible because there's little to indicate what went wrong or why. You have to just try it again the next time it shows up and hope you do a better job. It can be a pretty fun time when you get into the groove of it, and it's certainly worth mentioning that while it's $3 on Playdate's catalog, you can get an older version for free on itch.io, or the newer version from itch at a pay-what-you-want price starting at $1. So if you're even slightly interested, it's hard to say not to give the more basic version of the game a go for the whopping price of free. Just prepare to get a bit frustrated in the process. Next up is Picky Ricky, a game that despite its attempts to be cute is probably one of the worst playdate games I've tried so far, and remember that I've tried a lot of them. Picky Ricky is a platformer going for the utterly delusional price of $5 despite having 15 levels that each take well under a minute to complete, sometimes as little as 15 seconds if you book it to the finish line. Its main concept is you play as Ricky, a bunny that just can't jump. That comes to directly from the game's Playdate catalog page because Picky Ricky makes no effort to explain to the player what it's about and how to play it, making that a process of both reading its store page and figuring things out on my own. From what I can gather, in order to make Ricky jump, you must pull plants out of the ground with a crank to send him airborne for a couple of seconds. As you move through the level, you seemingly collect seeds you can plant to give you the ability to jump until you get to the final section of each level that contains a large turnip you must pull from the ground to win. Picky Ricky's refusal to explain literally anything in game was annoying, but even once I figured it out, I was having a dreadful time. The 15 second timer that begins each level can be extended as you play well, but mostly forces you to speed run like hell to have any hope of getting to the end. There's a 3 live system that makes absolutely no sense given that the consequence from losing one life or losing all lives is 
identical. You just restart the level. And even when I was getting into a groove and forcing myself to get through these levels to see if things improve, the biggest challenge I faced was hand cramps as I had to hold the D-pad while furiously turning the crank, which for some reason only worked when turning it counterclockwise, though thankfully there is a setting to substitute in the B button if you want. I didn't have anything resembling fun with Picky Ricky, and unfortunately wouldn't recommend it for $1. Never mind the $5 it's going for. Give Picky Ricky a pass. Pulse is a puzzle game for the playdate where you make your way through 84 stages to collect keys, flip switches, and figure out how to get to the exit under a strict time limit, with each stage generally taking 5 to 10 seconds. Taken at face value, Pulse is a completely average and arguably very basic puzzle title where you're not going to see much that you haven't seen before. What I would consider a major ding against it, however, is that at no point does the game save, an omission that's clearly intended to be a feature rather than a bug given its store pages insistence that the goal is to clear all stages in a single run. There's a practice mode that lets you practice particular stages in order to clear them faster, but nothing about these runs is randomized or new. You'll just be repeating the same stages and solving the same puzzles over and over, trying to beat your runtime and get on the leaderboard. It feels like it's billing itself as a roguelike despite having none of the randomization or design twists of a roguelike, and for those who aren't willing to do every single stage in one run, it's probably going to frustrate you more than entertain you. Also, I couldn't help but feel that the need to press the d-pad for every single bit of movement and do so quickly harms the game by harming my hand, and practically begs for a cramp. I didn't much like this title as you can probably tell, but there's probably an audience for it, and for the amount of stages, $3 isn't such a bad price if you aren't put off by its format. IFO is an arcade style score chaser where you use the playdate's crank to maneuver a plane to take out hordes of UFOs that are trying to kidnap livestock. This is a very simple game where your plane shoots automatically, and all you really have to do is turn the crank and occasionally use the directional pad to dash. Rescuing livestock will gain you some power-ups like different weapons or different shooting patterns, but overall what you see in the footage here is basically what you get. IFO will not win any awards for originality, but using the crank to control the plane felt good, and eventually I got into a groove where the gameplay, while basic, felt satisfying. That said, for how simplistic it is, I don't feel like it's worth its $5 price tag in any way relative to some other similarly priced titles on the Playdate store, especially Slitherlink PD, but if you see it on sale for a dollar or thrown into a bundle, it's definitely not a bad time. Castle Tintagel, Tintagel, I'm not really sure, is a retro action platformer that's sort of a Castlevania-like where you play as the last knight of King Arthur's Round Table trying to take down an evil sorceress. The game takes you through a variety of stages and environments and gives you the ability to jump, slash with your sword, or use spells to take down your enemies. I'll admit, I have no nostalgia for the old 2D Castlevanias because I never played them. I know, you can yell at me later. But I found the pace of Castle Tintagel to be pretty rough. While the level design can be interesting at times, controlling your heroic knight kind of feels like controlling a character who's struggling through a pool of quickly drying cement. He moves excruciatingly slowly, which doesn't help matters when trying to dodge enemy projectiles or make a tricky jump. That said, I do appreciate that there are some options to make the game easier for those like myself who don't really appreciate old school challenges with limited lives and limited checkpoints. You can tick off options in the menu to make enemies easier, make checkpoints more frequent, and have unlimited lives if you just want to get through the game at a more leisurely pace. I do think the $9 price tag is a little steep here, but overall, fans of the genre may want to give it a look. Last but not at all least is Resonant Tale, which is essentially a bite-sized playdate version of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. While there's no mistaking its simplistic visuals as anything but a consequence of its low-budget nature, it's surprisingly charming, with a good variety of music in the various locations and some clever little puzzles to solve as you make your way through its world. There are a couple little oddities I wasn't a fan of, like how difficult it can be to determine which obstacles can hurt you, and the odd reliance on hiding paths behind trees in ways that can make it unclear where to go, but overall this is a cute experience, worth the $5 for those who want a few hours on their playdate feeling nostalgic for some old Zelda titles. And that just about covers this month of playdate titles. While I don't think the average quality of the September titles was quite what I was personally hoping for, there are certainly some standouts, with Slitherlink PD especially being a game I keep coming back to and easily being one of my favorite titles on playdate. Hopefully future months deliver some more interesting titles and I'll be back to cover them when the time comes. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to the video and check us out on Patreon in the link below. And as always, thanks for watching.